This is the third in a five-part series of short vignettes honoring the 75th anniversary of the Great New England Hurricane of 1938. This segment is going to discuss the unique behavior of the wind field associated with landfalling hurricanes here in New England. New England hurricanes can be devastating, not only from their rainfall production and storm surge potential, but clearly from the ferociousness of the wind field associated with these systems. As you know, our hurricanes are typically moving rapidly if they head toward the New England coastline. For those that lie to the east of the track, the storm motion happens to be moving in the same direction from which the winds are blowing from. That combination can result in remarkable wind speed gusts and devastation across the New England region. One of the unique characteristics about our wind field here in New England is that it is typically very short-lived. And historically, our hurricanes have generally produced sustained hurricane force winds for no more than three to six hours. Due to the acceleration northward and the fact that the wind direction is in the same direction as the storm's acceleration, typically from the south or southeast or southwest, we can expect the highest winds and wind gust potential to be focused to the east of the storm track. Therefore, for residents of Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts, landfall over Connecticut or Long Island is a bad thing from a wind damage standpoint. Back in 1938, atop the Blue Hill Observatory in Milton, Massachusetts, at an elevation of 629 feet, the 1938 hurricane produced a 5-minute sustained wind speed of 121 miles an hour, with a peak instantaneous gust of 186 miles an hour. As a very crude rule of thumb, one can take the maximum sustained wind speed for one minute and add on the forward motion of the hurricane accelerating toward us. Putting those two values together will give you a first approximation of what your peak wind gust could be. The image in the upper right displays a radar image from Hurricane Bob at landfall back in 1991. At 2 p.m. in the afternoon, the center was over at Newport, Rhode Island, and you'll notice an extensive rain-free area east of the center, extending across Cape Cod and the islands of Massachusetts. The image in the bottom right-hand corner is a reanalysis of the actual wind field in knots. A typical character of our New England hurricanes is this separation of the core of winds. But due to the rapid acceleration and our hurricanes' interactions with jet streams at our latitude, our systems become what we call asymmetric, stretched out from a southerly to northerly direction. The core of wind separates from the eye. And in the case of Hurricane Bob, that separation was approximately 25 miles from the storm center. If we look at storms like Hurricane Donner in 1960, and most certainly the Great New England Hurricane of 1938, the core of wind with those two systems extended 40 to 50 miles removed from the eye. That's one reason why we preach to people, it's not necessarily where the eye goes that you need to pay attention. It's where the ingredients and the elements are going to play out. And for New England hurricanes, from a wind field standpoint, the damage and devastation will almost always be greatest some distance east of the storm center. If we use both Irene and Sandy as sort of a test for our hypothesis, notice uh, clearly with Irene, we had a core of wind centered over southeastern New England, Rhode Island, southeastern Massachusetts. With the storm track, indicated by the red line, going up across the Connecticut Valley of western New England, much of Rhode Island and southeastern Massachusetts was east of the track, where we would think we'd see the strongest winds. And even though Irene was a weakening tropical storm, she was still able to muster quite a bit of widespread wind damage, producing power outages up to seven days for parts of the area circled in green. If we compare this, however, to Hurricane Sandy's arrival in late October, you'll notice that there was only a very narrow area of wind gusts in excess of hurricane force. And those occurred only along the immediate south coast and only at the time when the wind direction shifted into the southeast. So while much of the area was seeing frequent wind gusts on the order of 40 to 60 miles an hour out of the northeast, we simply didn't have quite the damage to the tree canopy nor to the utility infrastructure that we witnessed during Irene where much of the region succumbed to strong, howling southeasterly winds. As for damage, in 1938 over 16 million linear feet of usable lumber was down in the northeast as a whole. Thousands of homes and businesses succumbed to the damage and along with the howling wind came devastating fires. New London, Connecticut was one such community that had its entire seaport nearly burned to the ground due to the combination of electrical and gas fires fanned by hurricane force winds for several hours as the storm came ashore. In our next segment, I will be discussing the power of the storm surge. We'll illustrate how fortunate we've been in the last few years with Irene and Sandy, but what the true potential is for much of the New England coastline should we have a return of another 1938 hurricane.